I hope you're having a good Thursday. I believe today is Thursday. I'm not sure what day it is anymore. <laughs> it is Thursday for us in DFW. You got that. Perfect. <laughs> Very good. It's always great to get your days right. <laughs> so yes, as Jeanette said, my name is Amparo Ortiz and I am an author. I write in multiple categories and for different age groups and in different genres. And so my journey started long before I ever published. I'm sure if there are any writers in the room or any creatives in the room, you would probably think, yeah, I started writing or I started drawing or I started doing anything at a very young age or at least dreaming about doing all of those things. And in my case, I started writing when I was about five or six years old, but it was short stories. So short stories were the first form of writing that I ever did, and it was terrible. I would absolutely not recommend anyone read what I wrote back then. And then I only did it to entertain myself and entertain my family. I never considered writing or publishing a career. And this is something that happens a lot to creative people in general. They do things and they consider them hobbies. And it's later in life that you realize, oh, I can actually make a living out of this or not make a living out of this, but I could do this for a living, you know? So I started writing when I was very young and then it wasn't until I was 14 years old that I actually started reading because what I wrote was basically things that I dreamt about or that I wanted to see because I had seen it on a television show or in a movie and I was just copy pasting what I saw and interpreting it in my way which I don't know if you do personally, but sometimes when we appreciate another form of entertainment, we tend to love it too much and we want to emulate it somehow. But we don't realize that what we're doing is that we're inhibiting our own voice or trying to copy someone else that we admire, but they're not us and they will never be us, right? So I feel like that's normal and natural. If you do that often, you can keep doing that, of course, because when we explore narrative voices outside of our own that's usually when we find our own voice so when i was 14 i started actually reading books i remember reading holly black's tithe i'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with holly black's work but i do remember that that was the first time i read an f-bomb in a book for young adults for teenagers and i was like you can do that you can actually do that in a book interesting so I opened up my own or broadened my own horizons through reading before I started writing seriously or before I took writing seriously. When I was 17 years old, I started writing my very first novel, my very first manuscript. Before then, it was just either short stories or poems, very bad poems, and you can imagine what they were all about. <laughs> Being a teenager and just finding your way and finding your place in the world, mostly. And then... I would not take any other longer form seriously in terms of my own writing, but I would read a lot of books. And so when I was 17 years old, I was taking an advanced English course or an advanced placement English course. And then when I was in class, I noticed there was one guy in the corner and he was not paying attention ever. He was just writing in a notebook like all the time. And I asked myself, like, what is he doing? Why is he even in class? So afterwards, I asked another friend of ours, a mutual friend, I'm like, what is he doing? Like, he spends his entire time writing in a notebook. And she told me, oh, he's writing his novel. He's working on a novel, a fantasy novel. And I thought that was so strange, but also really cool that he was not paying attention in class for the sake of his fantasy world. And he was taking, very, taking it very seriously. So I thought to myself, hmm, I have ideas in my head why don't I just write them down and see what comes out? And essentially what came out in the span of two years, because I started it at 17 and I finished it when I was 19 years old. What came out was really just a ripoff of every single mega fantasy property you can imagine. It was just a mishmash of things that older people had written or people who were no longer living <laughs> had written and protagonists, antagonists, conflicts that had no resonance personally to me as a creative. It was just something that I enjoyed as a fangirl. And then I queried that manuscript when I was 19 years old or when I was 20 years old, I believe. So querying is when you send out letters to literary agents. I'm not sure if you're familiar with literary agents, but they're just people who are hired to represent authors, help them find 
the best contracts, the best negotiations for their careers. And so oftentimes editorial houses will not allow unsolicited submissions into their slush piles, meaning that if you do not have a literary agent, these houses will not want to see your work. They will not read your manuscript. They'll immediately send it into the trash bin. And so that sucks to hear because it happens often, right? Sometimes when you look up a book that you love or that you admire, you go back to the acknowledgments page and you see the author thanking someone that is their literary agent. So that's how I discovered what a literary agent was. I was just quite confused at first. I was like, what is a literary agent? What, what do they do? And I started understanding that I personally would not be the kind of author who could self-publish successfully for a lot of reasons, but mostly because I really did need that middleman, that, that publisher to be the one to take care of anything from cover design to marketing and actually putting my book into the hands of readers themselves. I knew too much about myself and my personal work ethic to understand that that was not, I was not a self-published author or I didn't want to be the only person working for myself. And I didn't want to hire people myself and so on and so forth. So in order to get the attention of an editorial house, specifically for young adult fantasy, which is what I was writing at the time, or the manuscript that I wrote, I knew that I wanted a literary agent. So then I started researching what a literary agent does and how to actually attract the attention of one. And it turns out they ask for something called the query letter. So when you think of a query letter, you're basically selling your manuscript to someone, like pitching it to someone. But in the sense that you're telling them the gist of it, the most important parts, the most important beats, and leaving them with a little cliffhanger at the end, like a little hook, so that they're inspired or interested in reading more. Because sometimes literary agents will ask for just a query letter for just a pitch. Others will want five pages with your submission or 10 pages or maybe 20. And others will actually just ask for a partial, which is like 50 pages. And then if you get to that point where the agent is like, oh, I really enjoyed these 20 pages or these 25 pages, whatever it is, they will ask for your full manuscript. So you send the whole thing out, they read it, and they choose whether they want to represent you or not. And so I started doing that way before I was actually ready to share my work with professionals because this book or this manuscript, I should say, was not polished at all. No one else had read it. I had not edited it with actual feedback. And that's one of my main recommendations when you are looking to either self-publish or publish traditionally, which means that a publisher is actually working for you and with you. You have to share your work. You can't just think that what you are creating is enough on its own because at the end of the day, you are creating a product and others will consume it for lack of a better word, meaning that it should appeal to others, not just to yourself, but it should always appeal to yourself because if it doesn't appeal to you, what is the point of making it, right? So I exactly, your work cannot exist in a bubble. And I think it's tough because a lot of creatives are introverts. I don't know if you consider yourself an introvert, I consider myself an introvert. I don't necessarily like to tell people everything about myself or my creative work from the get-go. I like to unravel slowly in that regard. But a lot of creatives tend to keep their art close to their chests or close to the vest. And that's important to do if you feel like doing so. But you should have, even if it's just one other person who also writes, <laughs> yes, James McAvoy GIF for the, for the win. But I feel like if you have any sort of trepidation or you hesitate before sharing your work with someone, that's normal and that's completely fine. But you should also have at least one trusted person, another person who writes, another person who illustrates, someone who does what you wish to do as well. But maybe they're not that far ahead in their career or maybe they are. It just depends on who it is, right? Because sometimes we have friends who are published or they're doing a lot more than we're doing or vice versa. Maybe we're farther ahead than someone else. But the point is that you need to trust this person. I didn't do that. I did not trust anyone with my work. And so I started sending out query letters to literary agents. I believe I sent out 10, specifically 10. 
and all 10 were rejections or ended in rejections. They didn't even want to look at the sample pages and rightfully so because my letter was bad and just the concept itself, what I was pitching was literally a copy paste of things that I had seen and I just wanted to emulate, but with my name on the cover instead of, for example, like a token, you know? So it was really bad and I got rejected as I should have. And I immediately thought that I was never going to be published. I don't know if you're the type of person that gets immediate negative feedback and takes it very, very personally, takes it to heart and starts thinking the worst. I personally am that or was that person starting out because I was so in my bubble. I was very much a sensitive person in the sense that if one person thought I wasn't good enough, then I probably needed to rework everything. I didn't really take into consideration that literary agents are at the end of the day, they're just people. They have preferences just as you have preferences as a reader as well. So I didn't really think about that. And I thought that, oh, well, there goes my dream of being a published author. I have failed, I will forever fail. But it turns out that when I got those rejections, I took a break. I didn't really care about publishing that much for a few months. I focused on my my bachelor's degree. And then once I realized that I had another story in my head swimming around my thoughts, I was like, oh, should I write that? I haven't seen that actually. So I started writing another manuscript. And so here's the main difference. The first manuscript I ever finished, it wasn't the first I started, but it was the first one I ever finished. That one was terrible for many reasons. But the most obvious, the most glaring reason is that it did not represent me as a creative person or as a human being at all. There was no resonance. There was no handprint or fingerprint that was about me at all. So in the second project or for the second project, I really asked myself, like, who am I as a person? And then I could start asking myself, OK, well, then who am I as a writer? What do I want to see on shelves? What is missing on shelves that I could contribute or that I could help make visible in some sense? And so I realized very quickly that a lot of the fantasy that I was reading was usually centered around boys or men. And usually they were the ones saving the day. They were the ones getting the girl. Get, they were the ones doing all the great things and getting the pats on the back. And I, as not a man, <laughs> as not a boy, and especially as someone who is not even white or from the United States, I felt like, well, could there be space for women or girls who don't look like these protagonists that could also save the day? Is that a viable option in fantasy? And so I tried my hand at it. My second manuscript was actually a paranormal story. I queried that one as well in my 20s, early 20s. Turned out that I did not get any literary agent representation from that one, but I started getting requests from my query letters and my sample pages. And so I realized that I was getting better. I was progressing, but I didn't get like the dream or the dream didn't happen entirely, right? But this time when I was rejected, the world didn't feel like it was ending. It just felt like, oh, well, here we go again. I was writing to a trend, in this case, paranormal romance was really popular when I was writing this book. I was trying to capitalize off that trend and not in a super creative way, but there were things about my writing style that had progressed, that had gotten better. And I realized that very early on during the querying process. So I shelved that manuscript, even though I got several requests from agents, they were all ending in rejections and they were all saying the same thing. You have a great voice or you're, you're a good writer, but the concept is too meh. <laughs> so I realized, okay, so how do I make the marriage happen between good writing and fresh concept, interesting concept, something that feels original enough to stand out, but also familiar enough to have an audience. And that's a big part of publishing. Sometimes you can be a great writer, but the concept is overdone and publishers think that they know how trends work. Sometimes they fail miserably uh, predicting how trends will actually work and what will be successful versus what will not. But in my case, they were right. A paranormal romance was on its way out, specifically in young adult literature. And so 
the third manuscript and the fourth manuscript that I wrote, I never queried. I wrote them for myself and they were all novels, like prose novels. And then I believe it was my fifth manuscript was a high fantasy. It was an epic fantasy set in a world, a secondary world completely imagined by me. And that one actually got me some requests and that one led to an offer of representation from my literary agent, which is Linda Camacho at Galton Sacker Literary. And she was the one who read my manuscript. Interestingly enough, she rejected me. She said, oh, this is really interesting and you're a good writer, but I just, I feel like there's a lot of revision that's, that needs to be done. And maybe you're just not there yet, but I believe in you. Can we have a chat on the phone? And so when an agent asks to have a conversation on the phone, it usually means that they want to get to know you better before they offer you representation. So I immediately got excited. I immediately thought, well, this might lead to something. And it actually did lead to something. After an hour and a half of talking to her, she offered me representation. And so, but it's not usual to be rejected by that agent. And then later on, she's like, you know what? Let me check you out. Let me have a conversation with you and then they offer you representation, that's actually not common. Uh, usually it's very straightforward. They will want to read your sample pages. They will love your sample pages, schedule a chat, and then offer representation. But in my case, it was like, oh, this is good. Not good enough. Bye. And then I got the offer of representation. So it was very bizarre. But I've been with her ever since. That was in 2015 that we signed together. And yeah, it was, yeah, it was in December of 2015. So it's coming up. The anniversary is coming up. And what I signed with her was that high fantasy that I thought we were going to eventually take out to publishers to go on sub, which is how it's called. But it turned out that as I was revising this book, I started to hate it more and more. And also I started to get ideas for other projects, specifically a graphic novel. And so up to this point, I had expressed to my literary agent that I wanted to write in different genres, but I never mentioned graphic novels to her. And the thing is, I read comics growing up and I have friends who write comics and illustrate comics. And it was reading a script from one of my best friends. She said, you know what? I think that you should start your own, like you should have your own graphic novel. You should try writing a script. And I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna be good at this, but let's try it. So I wrote a script pushed my high fi fantasy to the side without telling my agent immediately. And then I eventually said, you know what? I'm not working on that high fantasy anymore. And here's a comic, <laughs> here's a graphic novel. She read it, loved it, but said, you know what? The market for graphic novels right now, if you are unpublished, it is much harder to publish when you are essentially a no one in comics. So I would suggest that you stick to prose novels for now and let's see what we can send out. Do you have any other ideas that you want to work on in the prose world? And I said, I want to write about dragons. I just don't know what these dragons are, what they're doing, where they're kind of like, like, what is the point of this book? I'm not sure, but I want to write about dragons. And then she was like, well, then write about dragons. <laughs> Go ahead. But when I started writing about dragons, it was January 2017. In September of 2017, that same year, I was still drafting my dragon book. I was still trying my hardest to get the pages written because it was such a long process to finally understand what the story was, what I wanted to say, who the characters were, what the conflict was. It took me all that time to figure out a lot, right? And then September 2017 happened and we in Puerto Rico, because this is where I live, I live in Puerto Rico, we got hit by two consecutive hurricanes, Maria being the devastating one. And I lost power, I lost water, I lost a lot of communication or I lost contact with a lot of my friends, other family members, and I had to recalibrate everything. I had to redesign my own life as both professional, because I also teach, I am an ESL instructor for college students. So I had to redesign my entire life as a professor and also as a creative. And I quickly realized that I did not want to write anymore. I lost my will to create. I just wanted to survive, or that was the main focus. Figuring out how my family and I were gonna feed ourselves, how we were going to go day by day without completely succumbing to 
desperation. And so it wasn't until the last weeks of November that we got power back and water back. And I started realizing, no, I really want to finish this dragon book. I want to finish it for myself. Like I want to do this to prove myself, to prove to myself, sorry, that I can do this and I will. So I did it. But in the middle of me finishing my dragon book, Linda, my agent, emails me and she's like, hey, have you heard about Lion Forge? They're a comics publisher in the US and they are looking for authors who were Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican authors or Puerto Rican writers, illustrators, because they want to create an anthology called Puerto Rico Strong to benefit victims of hurricanes Irma and Maria, but specifically Maria. And I was like, oh, interesting. Yes, I mean, I, I would like to participate in any way I can. And my agent was like, well, they would like a short story and they would like four pages, four to six pages, I believe it was the, the immediate email or the initial email. And it can be about anything you want, but it should be about, it should be related to surviving Maria somehow. And if it can tie to culture and history, that would be even better. So in the span of 15 minutes, I came up with a pitch for that story. I decided I wanted to feature a young girl who was obsessed with Julia de Burgos as a poet or a poetess. And her entire family was planning to leave Puerto Rico to pack their bags and leave to the US, which is what a lot of people here were doing anyway during that time. But she was anchored in her love for her country and she wanted to remind her family that no matter where we were or where they were, they would always be tied to the island in some in some respects. So I sent that pitch in 15 minutes. Lion Forge came back to us, told us they loved it. They wanted to see a script in three days. Like I literally had a weekend to outline the script, write the script, revise the script. And you might, you might say, Amparo, it's only four pages, it's fine. But for script writing, that is kind of daunting for me personally because scripts are very sparse or like the space is very minimal. So you have to be very conscious and deliberate with everything that you put in there. Like the images you want to show, what is being said, everything has to be so intentional and so precise that I was worried that they were gonna read what I wrote and they were like, no, this is actually not good enough at all. Turned out they really didn't, they <laughs> did enjoy it. And we published, it was a very quick turnaround. So I submitted that entire draft, like the final version. We, I think we edited once and then it went into production and the anthology published like two months after or, or three months after. And it would be this one right here. This is Puerto Rico Strong. It came out in 2018. And my short story is the very last one. <laughs> it's called What Remains in the Dark which is that one, that one right there. And this anthology, the following year in 2019, it won the Will Eisner Award for best anthology or best comics anthology, I should say. And if you are not familiar with the Eisner Awards, I like to call them the Oscars of the comics world. And so it's interesting that we did something out of love and to help out my country. And it just turned out to be rewarded in a way that I personally did not expect but I'm very grateful. And so that was my first publishing credit, something that was completely unplanned on my part. I did not see this coming at all. It came to me via my literary agent. I still worked on my dragon book though, and I kept at it, I revised, I sent it to people to read, I edited it with their feedback. And in October of that very year, oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> in October of that very year, I realized that I didn't realize my agent <laughs> forwarded another email to me from another publisher saying, oh, we want Amparo to audition for this project because I think that she would be a good fit for it, but we want to be sure. And so it was another comic, but it was a full length graphic novel. And it was an adaptation of a very famous work that I can't talk about because this book deal is not announced yet, actually. It was my very first book deal in 2018 and it has still not been announced. So I'm just gonna keep that to myself until it becomes public. But yes, I auditioned for another project, another graphic novel project, and I had to write 50 pages with a synopsis or a pitch, I should say. So I wrote the pitch, 
sent the pages to my agent, we revised, and then she sent them along to the editor who had contacted her at this house, at this editorial house. And it turned out that they loved my project, they loved my approach, and they offered me a book deal. And so that was my very first book deal, October of 2018. We signed that contract and we've been working on that project ever since. Graphic novels tend to take longer to produce and to wrap up everything than like a regular prose novel because there are so many moving parts in a comic and scheduling production is very difficult on the illustration side mostly. And so that's been taking a bit of a, of a while to announce and such and to complete. But yes, that was the first offer that I got for a book deal. Months later in February or March, I want to say, I think it was January actually, we got another, I want to say offer, but it was more like an invitation to audition for another project, another graphic novel, and this one for middle grade readers. So usually geared towards that 12 to 14 demo or 11 to 14 demo. And I was like, I've never written for middle grade readers. I've never written a protagonist that was 11 years old, but I'll try it. And so I auditioned, I think it was 25 pages this time. And I sent them over, they loved it. And they offered me a book deal, which was my second book deal. And that is coming out, that is from Harper Collins. It is called Saving Chupi, and it is coming out in 2023. That one I have wrapped up at writing. We are currently just finishing up all of the artwork, like literally the last pass of it, but it is taking a little bit more time. And the cover, if I'm not mistaken, will be revealed soon. So I'm excited to reveal that. And Ronnie Garcia is actually the illustrator for that specific project. We don't have a, an announcement for my first project yet, so, but I do know who the illustrator is and I'm very excited about sharing the work with them. And all this time I'm working on these audition projects, but I'm also working on my dragon book. And then I believe it was September, right in September, I skipped a part. In September of 2018, I go on submission with my dragon book. <laughs> it, was, it was titled just Blaze Wrath at the time, Blaze Wrath. And my agent was very positive. She was very supportive. She was like, oh, we're gonna, you know, this is definitely going to attract attention from editors. And I hope that we can get it sold relatively quickly. So that project was on submission for 10 months. And every single time that we would get a rejection, they would say the same thing, mostly. They were like, the world is great. The magic system is cool. The dragons are cool, but this is too ambitious. This is too much <laughs> for one book. And also, since there is no romance, there's no main love story in this book, it's reading rather young and you're trying to sell it as young, like older young adult, which makes very little sense as I say it right now, but more geared towards like a 17 year old, 18 year old, 19 year old audience. And people were saying, oh, this reads like a 14 year old girl or a 13 year old girl, simply because she doesn't have a crush on anyone or is not in a relationship, right? So I was like, okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, let's keep going. Let's see if we can find someone who loves this. And it turned out that we did find someone who loved it. Um, Ashley Hearn, my former editor at Pay Street Kids, they were the one who were like, oh, we need this book. We, I believe in this book. And the entire house agreed and they offered my third book deal for two books in that specific contract, which was the duology of Blaze Wrath Games and Dragon Blood Ring. So it would be these two books. This is the first one. This one came out October of 2020. It was my debut novel. And this one is the sequel. And this one came out a couple of weeks ago. I think it was three weeks ago. So sequel, debut. <laughs> and so as you can see, yes, there are dragons on each cover. And essentially, Blaze Wrath Games is the World Cup, but with teams from around the world who have dragon riders and steeds with different abilities, depending on their species, their nationalities and such. And my main character, Lana, who would be in the first cover, it would be this girl right here. She wants to represent Puerto Rico in the cup, but she would be representing the team or the country as the only player who has no dragon steed. She is known as the runner, and her job would be to literally get to the top of a mountain with an item called the iron scale. If the runner, 
or whichever runner gets to the top first, unscathed, gets the iron scale to the top, wins the game for their team. So she is very excited to represent Puerto Rico in this international tournament, but there is a dragon supremacist who wants to cancel the cup. And he believes that dragons should not belong to humans. They should not be used for, for sport or for entertainment. And he wants to free dragons all around the world. And if the cup is not canceled, he will start killing. So family-friendly stuff, really chill, non-violent fantasy at all. And the sequel, which came out a couple of weeks ago, follows, it, I believe it's four days right after Blaze Rock Games ends. And in this one, we have two narrators. We have Lana again, but we have Victoria, who is another member of Team Puerto Rico. And this time around, we're following both of them as narrators because my agent, or not my agent, sorry, my editor was like, you know, I really like Victoria. She's very different from Lana. What if we showed both of them together in the next book? And I was like, that's a good idea. That's a difficult thing for me to pull off, but it's a good idea. So Dragon Blood Ring is essentially the first time that I wrote two narrators instead of just one point of view, which was challenging for many reasons. But also it was very challenging, or the added challenge I would say, was writing a book in a pandemic. I would not recommend that. If you have the choice to not write a book during a pandemic, I would recommend to take that choice or to take that as your option because it was very difficult. It was one of the fastest drafts I've ever produced. I wrote it in two months, the first draft and I edited it in like three weeks before my editors ever saw it. But it was a lot of days of not writing actually in between those two months. It was a lot of days of doubting myself, of wondering if this is like, if this whole career is worth it in the end, because you know, the world is essentially imploding and it, other things take priority in terms of what you consider important. And so I still published it, still finished it and Lo and behold, as I am gearing up to promote Dragon Blood Ring, as I'm gearing up to finally have my second and final book in this duology out on shelves, I get another email from my agent. And she, I believe the subject line was Marvel Comics, Amparo Ordiz. Interested? Like a question mark at the end. I did not need to read anything else. I mean, I did read the entire email, but my instinct was essentially to look at the subject line and scream or like freak out. I can't remember if I screamed while I was freaking out, but I freaked out. And then I opened the email and she was like, my agent was like, oh, I got this request from Marvel. Check it out. Let me know what you, <laughs> let me know what you think. Exactly that GIF. I was that GIF. And then I was like, oh, uh, yes, you bet I'm going to read this email. And so I read it and it was essentially two of the Marvel editors asking for me because I had completely forgotten that my agent, one of her jobs, is to send out, I don't want to say submission packages, but materials for consideration. Sometimes a publisher, specifically publishers who hire authors for a specific project, like it's not like they have them on tap for everything. It's just like, oh, I'm looking for a Honduran illustrator. Let me see if I have one in my database, <laughs> you know? So Marvel actually was looking for uh, authors or they're always literally looking for writers for different projects. Their anthologies, Marvel's Voices, is one of those projects. And so I had my my materials sent to them by my agent a long time ago. And then they were like, oh, actually, yes, exactly. They were like, actually, you know, we're interested in seeing what she has, you know, for us. Because we wanted to write or we wanted to publish an anthology that was all Latin American characters and we wanted to use all Latin American writers and possibly illustrators too. So I had my pick essentially of which hero I wanted to write as and I immediately said to myself I'm doing White Tiger, Eva Ayala. I will fight anyone to the death if she is already taken. I will not refuse or I will not accept a, a no. So I luckily was the only person who requested Ava, but I am not the only white tiger in the collection. I am preceded by Daniel Jose Older, who is also a young adult author, and he's doing the original, the OG um, white tiger, which is Hector Ayala, who is Ava's older brother. So, and it was interesting because 
I never worked with Daniel before and I wanted to work with him. And this is just like beyond my wildest expectations to work with someone that I admire for a company that I have also admired for many years. So that one is actually that collection, Marvel's Voices Comunidades number one. That one is coming out in December. It got pushed back because of the supply chain issues. I'm not sure if you're aware. There's a like a paper shortage in the warehouse circuit in the US. So we are getting pushed back. Our release date is now December 9th, if I'm not mistaken. So still still coming out this year. So I'm excited to talk about it further and to have events with other people in this uh, in the collection. And America Chavez, actually, the person writing America is a personal friend of mine and someone who is also contributing to an anthology that I am editing. And I also wanted to talk about that because even though I got this offer and as I've noted, almost every single opportunity I've had to publish within the world of comics, I think all of them, if I'm not mistaken, all of them have been people who have reached out to my agent. In some respects, they were just looking for people who were interested, and most of them were people who wanted to work with me exclusively. So comics was never in the plan. It was something that I was interested in, but it was never something that I set out to actually do. It just fell into my lap, and to this day, it is the arena where I've had the most opportunities as an author. And so my duology is for young adults. It's a fantasy world, but it's actually just a fantasy set in our contemporary worlds. And I've also sold, this one actually sold last summer. It was a young adult horror anthology featuring all Latina authors. And some of them, most of them I would say are diaspora Latina authors. In my case, I am not diaspora. I've lived in Puerto Rico all my life. I currently live here. And we have another author who is Brazilian who still lives in Brazil. So, but most of our authors are living in the United States. And that one is a project that was a passion project of mine personally, something that I dreamt about for a very long time. I wanted to create an anthology or a collection of horror stories that featured monsters and myths from my specific culture and other Latina cultures. And I felt like it was sorely needed in publishing, specifically for younger readers, because when you think about the horror genre, you think about very popular works that are mostly published and written by men. So I felt like horror, I mean, not exclusively, of course, but I felt that we could do more and there's always room for more. So I felt like that is something I really wanted to do. And I asked one of my closest writing friends, I've known her for about 12 years now, and if she was interested in also co-editing with me, she said, yes, we have the same literary agent. So she sent out our proposal to houses. We had several offers of represent, uh, not, not representation, several book deal offers, and we went with Algonquin Young Readers. So Our Shadows Have Claws is our horror anthology, and it's coming out next fall, I believe in September. So I'm really excited to share that. I have started to see artwork for it, uh, I can't reveal too much, but I, I'm really looking forward to sharing this cover specifically. Or any of my covers. I like all my covers, but absolutely. Um, and yeah, right now I'm currently not on deadline for anything. I'm just promoting Dragon Blood Ring mostly and finishing up some edits for this anthology as an editor specifically. And yeah, I think my journey is not common. I feel like most people who want to write novels, they start out writing novels and they continue to pursue that specific line and in a specific genre. But is it difficult to write different genres? It is. Sometimes you just don't feel like you want to open up that document with that script and you just want to write an entire scene without thinking about captions and special effects and just what an image would look like illustrated right so it is tough but you have to train yourself to think about deadlines and you have to train yourself to think about what you wish to see eventually like what can you do now versus what you have to do now is a balance that when you're on multiple deadlines can be terrible uh, to your mental health but <laughs> it's also good because it reminds you that you know people are waiting for your work and people are excited about your work even if you don't have like a huge fan base or a readership I feel like 
someone out there wants your story, someone out there wants your art, it will mean something to them. And even if it means nothing to anyone, it means everything to you. Therefore, it has it has value and it's worth respecting. So that's what keeps me going, essentially. And also just deadlines in general. So as a student, as a professor, I have deadlines, but it's completely different when you have to be working based on how you feel because art is very much a mood type of job or it involves your mood a lot. So, but my advice would be just keep writing, keep creating as much as you can. And if you don't work well with deadlines, then set very small goals, depending on if it's a weekly thing or a daily thing. And I feel like slowly you will be gaining that sense of discipline that is required in publishing, whether it's comics or novels in general. So. And that's basically my journey so far. I hope to have more in the journey eventually, but so far that's pretty much it. <laughs> that was great. Um, so do we have any questions from the chat? You can either put those questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, share that question. Yay. I actually have one, um, if I may. Um, yeah, you don't. Um, so I know that some writers uh, kind of built a following doing uh, kind of fan writing, fan fiction, all that stuff before doing their debut work. Uh, yeah. But that's not the same path for all writers. And I'm wondering, uh, based on your experience, uh, do you recommend that aspiring writers first kind of build up a following and then publish? Or should we just go straight to an agent? I think it's definitely an individual thing. I don't think that anyone should technically do one thing versus another. But I do know, for example, there's a ve there are very popular authors right now who have started out, for example, writing on Wattpad, or they have their own blogs, blogs, and they have built a following slowly. But it's not necessary to do that. If you are that type of creative, then more power to you. But for the most part, it's not something that I would say, yes, do it because it will get you something. Do it because you want to do it. Do it because you love to do it. For example, I know that a lot of people, a lot of authors, specifically older, on the older side, uh, they have a lot to say about fan fiction and a lot to say negatively, I would, you know, actually state. <laughs> They're like, no, fan fiction isn't real writing, but writing is writing. Eventually, everyone has to put something on the page eventually someone has to read it and eventually it will create a reaction or it will create a sense of that satisfaction or enthusiasm and it will help the writer grow as a writer so i don't see how limiting experiences or telling someone not to perform certain things or to do certain things as an artist i just don't think it's the right approach <laughs> awesome thanks good to see you again of course I mean and we have a question from the chat from Maureen Denner, who oh, yes. um, is the program coordinator for our ASL program. So how do you remain motivated when starting out and you receive rejection letter after rejection letter? And that kind of reminds me of Stephen King. Like yeah. his story is that he had a nail on his wall with all his rejection letter letters, but then it got so heavy he had to put a railroad spike. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's so, yeah, very dramatic. That? <laughs> that's he super dramatic. dramatic. <laughs> it's like whatever works for you is what works for you if I were to do that I feel like I've gotten to the point and I don't know if this is just because of how long I've dealt with rejection because being an artist or being a human being means being rejected at some point but I don't think it's the same type of sting when someone rejects you as a person versus as an artist so I feel like some people take their rejections as artists more personally than if someone just dislikes them. And I feel like what I did to stay motivated was to think about all the stories that I still had left to say or to tell. Because initially my first manuscript was absolute trash, but I still thought, oh wait, I have more things to share. Do others want to see them? Probably not, but I want to share them. So that's mainly how I stay motivated in general. I start thinking about what's next. I don't linger on what's happening now. And if things are really bad now, there's always tomorrow. So I'm more of an optimist in that sense. 
I am very dramatic as well, but would I do what Stephen King does? Probably not. Because <laughs> you don't need it, like, in your face constantly. Right. I think it's like, I mean, it was, it. right. And also it's because it doesn't really, like, put a fire or light a fire under me to see people not like my work. It's just, like, it's just me personally saying, oh, I, I have more stuff to do. Like, I shouldn't yeah. be wasting my time on just this. No, right now. Yeah. So I have a question. So you talked about writing during the pandemic and then you talked about how dealing with the hurricane, you kind of lost your, your zest for writing. Um, can you, de- can you maybe describe like, was there going through that disaster the first time? <laughs> yeah. Did you feel more prepared for the sec for, for going through the pandemic or like what were some things that helped you through it as a creative? Cause I know we're going to talk later today with Alejandra is going to talk Yay. about, you know, writing things that we don't want to write. Um, right. So yeah, if you could speak to that, that'd be great. Well, when I was dealing with the hurricane aftermath, I felt like it was just the worst I'd ever had it because I literally had no quality of life. It was more of just like, it was beyond a mood thing or a, like an attitude. It was my physical reality was not contributing to having any sort of positive outlook on life. And then, but I still felt like we would eventually get through it. But during the pandemic, there was nothing that was like, I had power service, I had water. I knew that I could, you know, leave my house following certain guidelines and such. But I felt like, what was the point of it if all I'm doing, like, as an introvert is looking into my computer screen all day and I feel like that's the only life I'm having, you know? And it's just like, am I the only person who cares about these books? Am I the only person who cares about what I'm doing? I don't think that I should be worried about this book when the world is literally on fire. And also, I was revising Dragon Blood Ring. Was I revising? Yes, I, I wrote Dragon Blood Ring in the summer during the pandemic when it was kind of essentially just starting. And then I revised it during the election period. So if you're not aware, oh in Puerto God. Rico, yeah, in Puerto Rico we have like our separate elections. So I was kind of just concerned about the United States election and Puerto Rico's election. It was double the stress. <laughs> and I was like, how am I going to revise if all I'm doing is watching the news and refreshing my feed, you know? So I felt like it was just a lot of stress that was in, I put it on myself if that's the main difference. Because with the hurricanes, it was everything around me. And then for the pandemic, it was like, I can't really see anyone who's sick. I don't know people who are getting sick. I don't, I'm not getting sick myself, but I know these things are happening. And I know that everyone is telling me not to do certain things. So I'm not doing them, but like, I feel very lonely. (laughs) And that loneliness crept up on me in ways that I didn't foresee. And I think that that's why I didn't want to work. I just wanted to sleep all day and watch K-pop videos and just be like a normal person outside of work. Yeah. And I, I'll just kind of end with a comment because um, like our speaker earlier today was talking about how um, writing, I guess what I'm seeing is like the publishing world. It's all, it's all about the relationships that you build. Like you were talking about how your, your agent liked you and then people wanted to work with you because they've seen your stuff. Yeah. She was talking about how going to the bar was like, the essential thing after a con and so right. yeah i'm just seeing it about like a, being about relationships and being game like being open to that so. yes also that's very important because you never know when your next job is gonna come or your next source of income <laughs> in publishing is just it's a very strange line of work to be honest there's no stability there's no way to foresee anything And sometimes you think, oh, I would never write a sci-fi novel, but then you get a sci-fi idea. And you're like, oh, wait, what's happening? And then you just can't close yourself to anything in general in life. Although, of course, if you know yourself well enough, you know, I will never do this or this will never be my thing. But at the same time, (laughs) exactly. Or I will never, for example, I will never never date this person or I will never go to this country or whatever it is, right? But at the same time, it's like, or this bar, I should say, I'd never go to this bar. But it's like... At the same time, it's like, wouldn't I? Maybe yeah. I would. And the way you, you describe know? it is very much like any kind of creative process where it's like one thing leads you to another, leads you to another. And yeah. then that's how you grow, not only as an artist, but as a person. 
Yes, it leaves a trail of breadcrumbs. And the problem is that you become hyper visible. Everyone knows that, or not everyone knows who you are necessarily, but you are available to everyone who seeks you. And it's, it's jarring and it's nerve wracking, but at the same time, it's very freeing because you feel like, I'm being seen, you know, I don't have to work that hard in terms of, hey, I'm here. But at the same time, yes, you have to work hard because people will want a thousand other books before they will want yours. And it's like, oh, well, thank you for knowing that I'm here, but also support me, you know. <laughs> so those are, <laughs> you know, different things that you have to take into consideration. But the most important thing is that you like yourself and that you believe in your work. Exactly. If you don't like yourself that much as an artist, and you have more to work on before you fully feel comfortable sharing your work with others, do that work and go down your own path. Eventually you will get to where you need to get. I do believe that we make our own choices. You know, some, some people think they believe in destiny and all these things, and that's all very valid, but you have to move with intention and you have to be aware that if you don't make something happen, it probably never will. So. Yeah, exactly. I like to say that um, the, being lucky is it's being in the right place but it's also being prepared you know, right to take advantage of that opportunity when it arises yes because let's say someone offers you your dream job but you're not the person that they expect you to be to do that yet you will fail you said yes but you will fail right but in failure there's lessons and you have room for improvement so really just don't limit yourself the world is your oyster is that the saying is that how you say it yeah <laughs> Well, I think so you said just, it best when you said, you know, there's someone out there wants your story. There, there's, yes. You know, I've, I've heard before, it's like, you need to write your story because there's somebody out there with a hole inside them that your story fits into. Right. Um, and oh, it has, I love and that. that has value. That has value. It'll resonate. Yes. And it should first and foremost resonate with you. And then someone else will be like, oh, my God, I see myself in this. This is my truth. But someone else is also having it as their truth or has it as their truth. Awesome. There's nothing more powerful than community, I feel so. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like that was the theme from this morning's talk and now that you're picking up is really it's about finding your tribe. It's about finding yes. the people that you like and the people that you enjoy who are going to inspire you and you're going to enjoy reading their stuff too. So. Yeah, I mean, the person that I'm co-editing with the horror anthology, Shamile Sayed Mendes, she's also a young adult author and a middle grade author, but we met like 12 years ago because we had writing blogs. And never in a million years would we have thought we would end up signing with the same literary agent and that we would be authors and that we would co-edit a horror anthology of all things. Yeah. So you just never know where life will take you, but you yeah. need to start helping it take you somewhere, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Getting into those places. All right. If we don't have any more questions from the chat, um, I think that'll do it for our session. So I'm putting a link Yay. into the chat. Um, please evaluate this session, especially if you're doing this for extra credit for an instructor, you can put your information in there and I'll send that to your instructor. Otherwise, Amparo, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. This, this has value for us and I really appreciate your time that you've chosen to spend with us. Thank you.